Kia ora, good morning everybody. I'm sort of coming in in a bit of an unusual way, in a bit of a hurry this morning. I've just been out talking to a lot of your children, uh, telling them that my main responsibility is to make the appearance better by speaking to them on a, every Sunday morning. And they, they affirmed that idea. I asked them who thought that was a great idea and they all put their hand up. So, um, yeah, so we spent a little bit of time talking about uh, the Good Samaritan. Well, anyway, we're... Um, where are we? I'll just move this forward here. Um, we are day one of a new government, and uh, as the Bible tells us, we should pray for our government. So before I even get into, um, into that, we're reminded in Romans 13 that God appoints the powers, the governments, into our nations as a... Uh, indicated to him, to us, of his, his um, place within our world. And our responsibility is to uh, be good citizens in respect to the laws that are given. So um, irrespective of where you are on the political spectrum, your responsibility is always to pray for those who are in power over us. So let me lead us in prayer this morning. Father, as we have come off the back of this election for, with all its toing and froing, with all its promises and hopes and aspirations, we know, Lord God, that uh, you're the one who orders the authorities that are in our world. And um, for that reason, Lord, we come before you and we ask for your blessing to be upon our nation. And to bless our nation, Lord, we need a righteous government. And so we pray for that righteousness, Lord. And we ask that there would be no evil, that there would be no covering up, but there would be real transparency, real openness, a real heart towards the people of this nation. So we pray for Jacinda Ardern as our Prime Minister. We pray for her, her government. And we pray for all those members of Parliament who are ushering themselves into a whole new order of participation in what it means to govern our country. And so we thank you, Lord, for the nation we live in. We thank you for the freedoms that we enjoy. And we pray, God, that you protect those for us. And we ask this in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen. Well, today we're going to head towards communion at the end of this, um, end of this talk that I'm bringing. Because what we're doing is we're looking at uh, this passage in Corinthians. We find that Paul, once again, is not very happy with the way that the church has been conducting itself. We have Holy Communion here as a church about once a month, uh, but today I'm entitling this message Unholy Communion. For those of you who have ever read this letter that Paul wrote to the Corinthians, you'll, you'll understand exactly what I'm just going to enter into. So what Paul is going to do is he's going to uh, address the individual groups within this community and ask them to consider with real sincerity their attitude towards being together and their attitude towards what we know as the Lord's Supper or Holy Communion or the Eucharist, depending on the tradition that you may have come to be here with today. So here goes Paul, and once again, Paul holds back nothing. Here he says, in the following directives, I have no praise for you. Hey, that's good, enough. For your meetings do more harm than good. That's getting worse. In the first place, I hear that you come together as a church. There are divisions among you, and to some extent, I believe in it. No doubt there have to be differences among you to show which of you have God's approval. Now, this is an opening statement. Can we just get the boom out of this, Nathan? Thanks. There's an opening statement here that Paul is immediately grabbing people's attention. You know, if Paul was to come to our meeting here, and he walks up on stage and he goes, I tell you what, your meeting together does more harm than good. Immediately you go, really? Okay, I better listen in, better get some, something going here because there's something that I have to learn. Well, at least you'd hope that would be the attitude. But Paul then goes on to say that there are differences among you. And, and he defines those differences as that which can tell, like we can tell, that there are those who have God's approval upon them and, God's who do not, and those who do not have God's approval upon them. Which is very, very threatening, isn't it? Because immediately you're thinking, oh, I wonder if it's me. I wonder if it's me. I wonder if it's me that God doesn't approve of. 
And Paul says the differences that are amongst you actually are a sign that some are being approved in their lifestyle and their worship and their Christianity and others are not being approved. And so we can easily see how this, this outworks itself because we know that difference is okay. Difference is fine. And within the body of Christ, we have to have a very broad understanding of difference. There is a lot of difference within the body of Christ. As we know, we have denominations that focus on, drill down on different uh, specified um, targets, if you like, that say we really, really have to hold on to this one truth as being a vital representation of who we are as a church community. And so we have that, that division. It's not necessarily a bad division, but it is a division within the body of Christ. And amongst us here today, there'll be people who have different priorities, different emphasis in the way that they view their faith, outwork their faith. And that's, that's a good thing. We're going to have a look at that in a few weeks' time as Paul decides to help them understand the spiritual gifts that they've been given. Differences are not all bad. But if the differences that we have um, play out to be self-seeking, arrogant, proud, one-upmanship, you know where I'm heading with this, all of those bad traits that we know create division rather than unity, then we end up with those differences breaking up the body of Christ. Now, we've got to have um, unity around Christ and Him crucified, but there are certain things and other things within Scripture that literally for centuries, brighter minds than mine, have wrestled over for decades and decades and still never completely reconciled. So for me, I have a very simple attitude towards that, and that is that I can live with that difference as long, but I can't live with the arrogant attitude. You know, the attitude is the most important thing that goes on here. There will always be differences amongst us because of the way in which we have been raised or we view scripture. But Paul is saying, listen, these differences aren't necessarily theological. These differences are actually sociological. They're more about how you're outworking your faith, how you're living your faith. And so what Paul is saying is that the, the difference is evidence in the fruit in your life. It's fair to say? That's understandable? The difference is fruit in your life. Um, And we've got to keep on reminding ourselves of these coat hanger statements that appear within this letter to the Corinthians. The coat hangers being about the fact that we have freedom. We have freedom. But how do we manage our freedom? Paul said, I have the right to do anything, you say, but not everything is beneficial. I have the right to do anything, but not everything is constructive. No one should seek their own good, but for the good of others. You see, Right throughout Scripture, there's a restoration process going on that takes us back to the freedom that we experience in the Garden of Eden. God's original plan was being outworked there, where he could walk and talk with his creation in the cool of the evening. It's a beautiful picture. Uh, so, so God gives us the sacred choice, of, sacred gift of making our own choices. The sacred gift of making our own choices. What we're doing when we're raising children is we raise them up to a place where they have the ability to make their own choices without killing themselves. That's sort of the general principle, isn't it? You know, Left to themselves, children will usually do themselves in. Okay? Um, so what God does is he asks us to be mature in the process of making our own choices. The thing about this freedom is that uh, it's, it's a really positive thing, but it has consequences. You see, God gives you the sacred gift of making your own choices, but God does not give you immunity from what will result from your free choice. So I have the right to jump off a cliff, but that will not cancel the law of gravity. Yeah? I have freedom to, even in the worst of situations, be unkind to my neighbors or unkind to my family. But the end result will be a life of loneliness. It's pretty obvious, isn't it? All these things are very obvious to us. The difficulty that we have, and more so in a liberal society, is that people want to have increasing choices, but for some reason convince themselves that the natural outcome of those choices is not going to be negative. Those of you over the last few weeks who have voted uh, in respect to the cannabis bill and the the, uh, end-of-life choice bill uh, have had to wrestle with the implications of those choices because the very short-term impact of those choices can be told, sold to us as being something really, really positive. We're told it's positive. But the long-term implications, I think, will be something far different to that. In the book of uh, Ecclesiastes, the writer there says, if we sow the wind, we'll reap the whirlwind. 
You sow the wind, we'll reap the whirlwind. And so uh, in a couple of weeks, we know we'll hear the results of that referenda. But as Christians, we have freedom, and how our freedom is being outworked um, is something that's so critical to the way that our Christian faith is evidenced in our own lives and by evidence as far as others see the evidence of what it is that's outworking itself. So when Paul looked at the congregation and says, I can tell who has God's approval or not, it's really by the fruit of the lifestyle. So remember what Paul said? He says, I have the right to do anything, but not everything is beneficial. I have the right to do anything, but not everything is constructive. No one should seek their own good, but the good of others. And that's, that's the issue here. That's the big question, is that I have a freedom to do whatever I want, but is it for the good of others? Does it actually help others? Does it impact others? And that's why our own freedom, must always, the choice of freedom must always be welded to the good of others. I say welded as in strongly tied into, strongly connected. Uh, there was a, a family down in Wellington a couple of years ago who bought this house on one of the coastal hills there overlooking the harbour. And when they came in, they bought this house and there were houses all around them. And they decided that they didn't want the neighbours having any view of their backyard. So they built this monstrous fence. Some of you would have seen this on the news. This monstrous fence, which completely cancelled out their neighbours' view of the harbour, which they had literally paid millions of dollars to get. And for them, it was like, I have a right to do this. I have a right to do this. And so on the basis of their rights, they decided they'd build this fence. And the council couldn't do anything initially because they said, well, yeah, you have a right to build this fence. Uh, so they got taken to court and the judge said, yes, you have a right, but you've, you've failed morally. We're a community. You can't do this sort of thing. And he ordered them to take the fence down, which sounds like a really big deal. But it's amazing how, how our own good often is put before others' good, other goods. Now, now um, <laughs> I'm not sure if I should tell this story. It's a very simple story. I come in from Tapuna uh, most mornings, and uh, there's a bit of traffic usually backed up before the Wairua River there. And so I have a choice, just pretty random, really. I can go, go, go through Tapuna and come down the, the road by the river there, Station Road, or I can come down the main highway. But there's a, a junction there where the, the traffic merges. And so when you're coming off the Station Road there, and you have to wait until someone opens a gap for you, yeah? And I am surprised. I have these little character assessments going on. I can look half away, half a dozen cars up, and I can see these people, young, old, male, female, you know, a professional businessman, someone in a, in a work truck, you know, a tradie. And I'm wondering to myself, who's going to let who in here? And I can never guess. I can never guess. But there's this incredibly steely, self-centered determination that is on the face of those who won't let somebody in. Their eyes are locked <laughs> like this. It's like a horse with blinkers. It's like, you do not exist in my world. Because why? Because I have to get to work. I have to get to work three seconds earlier than I would if I let you in. Okay? And the reason why I raise this is because I have sat there and I've watched some of you go by doing just this. <laughs> and on my next slide, I have a list of... No, no. It's true. It's true. It's true. I've seen some of you. And I just I sort of think, you know, in the big scheme of things, the big scheme of things, just be human. Welcome to the human race. Didn't Jesus say, do to others as you'd have them do to you? Do you want to be sitting there just smiling at all these people coming by? Hi, let me in. Anyway, it's my little grudge for the day. So, not really. So, Paul said this. In the following directives, I have no praise for you, for your meetings do more harm than good. In the first place, I hear that when you come together as a church, there are divisions among you. And to some extent, I believe it. No doubt there have to be differences among you to show which of you have God's approval. Now, I just want to take us back to the early part of this chapter because I think Paul is alluding to something that he made a very big statement about earlier on. And this is this. He said this. By the grace God has given me, I laid a foundation as a wise builder and someone else is building on it. 
But each one of you should build with care, for no one can lay any foundation other than that which is already laid, which is Jesus Christ. If anyone builds on this foundation using gold, silver, costly stones, wood, hay, or straw, their work will be shown for what it is, because the day will bring it to light. It will be revealed with fire, and the fire will test the quality of each person's work. If what has been built survives, the builder will receive a reward. If it is burned up, the builder will suffer loss, but yet will be saved, even though as one escaping through the flames. Paul called the Corinthian church saints. It's the biggest declaration of faith I think Paul ever writes. Because we have just spent weeks and weeks and weeks outlining all the atrocious behavior that exists in this community. And yet he calls them saints. And Paul talked about how it is that their actions will be either like silver and gold, which will stand the test of time and the fire of judgment. But then Paul said there'll be other actions that we bring, which God will, will burn up. Now, if I had a piece of steel here, I didn't because I'd, I'd cook myself with it, I'll burn it, and I put the fire to it, um, we know that that steel will hold its, uh, its strength, hold its uh, place, it's not going to disappear. But, um, you know, what's going to happen with this piece of uh, paper here? Of course, you know, this is, this is what happens when paper gets tested. It just burns up. So there we go. That didn't hurt anybody. But I can smell the smoke. Ooh. When Paul's looking at this gathering of people, he can smell the smoke. He can smell the smoke of the hay, wood, and stubble that is being offered to God as something that is completely inappropriate as, a, as an act of worship or, or a sense in which you're caring for one another. You see, what Paul is saying is this, what he literally says is, so then, when you come together, it is not the Lord's supper you eat. You know, he's saying your meetings do more harm than good, you're getting, gathering together for a communion service. Well, Paul says, I wouldn't even call it that. Now, Paul's understanding of communion was probably very centered around the traditions, of course, of the Passover meal. And uh, here's Leonardo da Vinci's favorite, sorry, I'm saying favorite, uh, world famous picture of the apostles all sitting on one side of the table eating dinner. Okay? Which is not how you normally do it, but for our benefit, we get to see them. But what happens in the upper room the night that Jesus uh, described to the disciples what was going to happen is they, they had this Passover meal together. And it was very ordered. And traditional Jewish families still have this Passover meal today. Uh, and the food on the table is representative of the journey that Israel went through. And so people would stop, talk, read scripture, eat from certain portions of the meal, there was salt water that represented the tears. There's uh, bitter herbs that bring tears to your eyes, again, to, to describe the feelings and the emotions of the people of Israel when they were in slavery in Egypt. Uh, there's honey nuts, honey and nuts uh, there, a combination of that. And that's, there's a picture of the bricks and the mortar. Sorry, the bricks that they were made, asked to make as slaves. And so lots of different symbolism there in this meal. So when this meal was eaten... Uh, there was an order to it. There was a tradition built over hundreds of years. And, uh, and however, Paul now is trying to take this tradition, this understanding of the sacredness of this meal that Jesus initiated, and he's trying to get this rabble to come into some sort of order to allow themselves to fully appreciate what it is that God has done for them. And, and I keep asking myself, how did Paul end up with this rebel, this absolute crazy bunch of people, because we're going to see how bad they get in a minute. And uh, I, went, I went back to the book of Acts, and I'll show you this. Paul, when he went to Corinth and he established the church, he was preaching to the Jews. And yet in Acts chapter uh, 18 here, it says, Then Silas and Timothy came from Macedonia. Paul devoted himself exclusively to preaching, testifying to the Jews that Jesus was the Messiah. But when they opposed Paul and became abusive, he shook out his clothes in protest and said to them, your blood be on your own heads. I'm innocent. I'm innocent of it. From now on, I will go to the Gentiles. Okay, so Paul's preaching amongst the Jews, those who understand the Passover traditions, those who would understand this 
change that would bring them to the Lord's Supper. But because they get abusive to him, Paul finally is worn out. And he says, literally, to hell with you lot. Let let the blood be on your own heads. I'm out of here. I'm going to the Gentiles. Now, that's a big call. Because for all of their abusiveness, at least the uh, Jews had some level of tradition, some level of understanding what it meant to be a religious community. So Paul goes and embraces this crazy bunch of people who are involved in sexual immorality, prostitution at the temple, uh, different attitudes towards all parts of society, not a relatively ordered bunch like the Jews were. So then, so then, so then, so then, (laughs) so then, when you come together, it is not the Lord's Supper you eat. For when you are eating, some of you go ahead with your own private suppers. As a result, one person remains hungry and the other gets drunk. Don't you have homes to eat and drink in? Or do you despise the church of God by humiliating those who have nothing? What shall I say to you? Shall I praise you? Certainly not in this matter. See, wild times, man. Wild times. It's really hard for us to imagine this being a church community. It would be like this portion of the church over here, led by one of our elders, Adam Yates and his wife, and they would have turned up early, and they would have had the best wine, and they would have got their little group together. Don't feel condemned, Adam. Got their little group together, and they would have gone, we're having a party and we've got all my mates here. Okay? Got all my mates. And you lot aren't invited. Yes, we're church, but we're doing our own thing. And then another group's come in, and they may have been slaves and servants. They've been working really, really hard. Okay, and Jason Rowling brings them all in. He says, come on, crew, we're in here. Hey, Jace, hey, bring the team together. And uh, you know, he pulls out a loaf of bread that's been sitting under his armpit, keeping warm for the last six hours. And he says, hey, guys, um, this is all I've got, but I'll share it with you, you know? And so here he is sharing it. But over there, it's getting louder and louder because they're drinking more wine. And uh, all that's going on is this, this division. And, and what's happening is uh, people are being humiliated. The level of exposure to what you have and don't have is exaggerated, not minimized. And so it's a complete opposite to what it is that God was trying to generate. You can call this what you want, but it isn't the Lord's Supper, Paul said. Okay? You can put lipstick on a pig. <laughs> but it's still a pig, okay? You put lipstick on a pig, but it's still a pig. And it was pretty much just a pig's breakfast going on. That's, that's what's going on. It was such a disaster. These saints in Corinth, divisions among you, eating separately, some remain hungry, some get drunk. You humiliate the poor, Paul said. You know, there must have been days when Paul said, ah, oh, man, I think I'd rather take a beating from the Jews than put up with the rubbish that these guys give me. Eh? But Paul's called to the Gentiles, and he just has enormous faith. And I know some of you at the moment are looking at the behavior of those that you love, and you're going, oh man, that is just such a contradiction to the Christian life, and and you you need to hold on to the same level of faith that Paul had. Paul was looking at these people going, oh Lord, seriously? And he had such a high vision for these people. The sense in which he could see a future of what it was God was going to do in their lives. And I just really, I just think, you know, when you look at Paul's life and all the miracles that he performed, this has got to be one of the biggest attitudes of the heart that is seeking by faith to see what isn't there come about. And that's what we do when we pray for those we love, eh? Pray for those who are far from God. Is that we, we believe in God that this person will become the fullness of who God has created them to be. And that's what Paul is saying to them. But he doesn't hold back. This is a tough love thing. Okay, This isn't blessing the mess. Paul is diving in there saying, look, I've got to rip this thing apart. You guys have got to start again. This is rubbish. Call yourself a church. This isn't what churches do. This isn't the Lord's Supper. And so what Paul does now is he goes on and he tries to strip back this gathering of crazy behavior and he tries to strip it back and center it 
on the person of Jesus, which, of course, is the whole reason for it anyway. Okay, so Paul says this. For I received from the Lord what I also passed on to you. The Lord Jesus, on the night he was betrayed, he took bread, and when he had given thanks, he broke it and said, this is my body, which is for you. Do this in remembrance of me. Now, I could imagine that in that setting, if Paul had been present, and remember he wasn't present, but he was writing this letter, if Paul had stood up and took the opportunity and he'd said these words, I think there would have been a soberness that came over the community at that time. Because all of a sudden, just as we do in communion, as we hold it here, there's a soberness because we stop and we zero in on the thing that is the most important part of our faith, yeah? The very center of our faith is Jesus Christ and him crucified for our sins, raised from the dead. So Paul is saying, do this in remembrance of me. Then he says, in the same way, after supper, he took the cup saying, this cup is the new covenant in my blood. Do this whenever you drink it in remembrance of me. For whenever you eat this bread and drink this cup, you proclaim the Lord's death until he comes. Again, simplifying the whole process, bringing it down to a place of sober reflection. And when these sober reflection moments happen, we have a moment. We have a moment with God, a moment of revelation, where God will become very close to us, not just in the physical elements of the bread and the wine, but in that moment we allow God the room to speak to us, where the Spirit will prompt you about something, affirm you or challenge you. And it's a beautiful thing because it's God's relationship with us that's being worked on here. Um, So when we look at the bread and the wine, which you will do in a few moments because it's going to be handed out now, Um, God invites you to have a moment, a moment where you can consider your own life in light of the sacrifice of Christ. Because Paul is very, very strong about our attitude. Let's have a look at what he says. So then, whomever eats the bread or drinks the cup of the Lord in an unworthy manner will be guilty of sinning against the body and blood of the Lord. Everyone ought to examine themselves before they eat of the bread and drink the cup. For those who eat and drink without discerning the body of Christ, eat and drink judgment on themselves. Wow, sober moment. You notice how Paul doesn't start telling off the individual groups, start telling off people specifically for what it is that they have done, their behaviors. What Paul does here is he raises their sights above their behavior. He points them towards Jesus and he points, them, points out to them what it is that a community do together when they are focusing on Jesus and how they bring their whole selves to that point of connection with the body and blood of Christ. When by doing so, you allow God to speak to you. Paul doesn't, take, doesn't see any advantage in ripping into people and telling off their behaviors. What he does is he points their sights higher. And that's That's what the the church community is built upon. It's built upon an understanding that God calls us not only out but up, out but up into a community of faith where we celebrate the goodness of God in our midst and we're all put into um, a sober reflection because of that. We right-size ourselves because of that. And Paul goes on to be so strong about this. He says, you know, your spiritual life affects your well-being, your, spirit, your physical well-being. That is why many among you are weak and sick. And a number of you have fallen asleep. Not because the sermon was too long. Fallen asleep is, is a, a nice way of saying you died. Okay? You died. But if we were more discerning with regard to ourselves, we would not come under judgment, such judgment. Nevertheless, when we are judged in this way by the Lord, We are being disciplined so that we will not be finally condemned with the world. Paul is making a distinction here, which is really powerful, because he said some of you have God's approval upon you, some of you don't. Some of you have got actions going on in your lives that smell like smoke. Some of you have actions going on that are hay, wood, and stubble that will go up in the flames. And God is saying to you, listen, it's not about eternal judgment here, because as he said, as one escaping the flames, you'll be saved because your confession is Jesus Christ. But when you come and present your life 
to God on that day of judgment, it's going to go up in smoke. Because why? You took the grace of God and you used it for your own purpose, not for the purpose of others. You took your own freedom, uh, freedom that a loving God has given you, and you've used it in the wrong way. And so during this time of communion, it's a sacred time because it's an opportunity for us to take a spiritual inventory, a spiritual inventory. And um, I mean, this is the sort of thing we should be doing with our lives every day. But Paul says, you know, when you meet together, do this and use the opportunity not for a drunken party, but for sober reflection, for quietness, to allow the spirit to come amongst you, lead you, guide you, test you. One of the problems that we have within a, uh, a service like this is that we don't have a great deal of time usually to reflect upon the things that we do need to get right. But let me just, let me just put this out there. Spiritual awareness means occasionally we'll let the communion pass us by. Because we shouldn't be taking the, these elements in an unworthy manner. So if there's things in your life that you know you have to sort out, if there's unforgiveness that you know you're holding back on, or if there's something illegitimate or illegal that you're participating in, these are the things that God wants to quicken to you. And so from time to time, as you are going through this life, and in this life you will know trouble, okay? It's, it's no sin. In fact, it can be a sign of spiritual maturity when you just take those elements and you just pass them over to the next person. And No one's going to judge you. They shouldn't judge you. Because remember what Jesus said to the Pharisees who wanted to stone the woman in adultery? Those of you who have not sinned, you're free to cast the first stone. And so communion for us should be something that uh, we arrive in the car park on, here on Sunday and we remind ourselves that, you know, usually we do this in the first week of the month. You should get this awakening and you're in the car park and you go, Phew. it's communion Sunday. Hold on. I think I'll go fishing. No. It's communion Sunday. This is a day where I, I account for my spiritual walk with God. This is the moment I account for my conversations that I've had with other people. This is the moment where I account for my priorities. This is the moment I account for the hay, wood, and stubble that I know is part of my life, and we've all got hay, wood, and stubble, believe me. But this is the opportunity for us, by the grace of God and through the gift of God, to discern what it is that God is leading us through and to. Because he's always leading us through something, and he's always leading us to something. So this morning, as um, we're handing out these elements now, um, I just want to remind you that this gift of communion is truly that. It's a gift. It's a gift from God to remind us that we have been given this wonderful salvation through Jesus' own body and his own blood. And we need to remember this in a way that is worthy, worthy of Jesus. So on the night that Jesus was betrayed, he took bread and he broke it and he said, this is my body broken for you. which at the time wouldn't have meant a great deal to the disciples. But two days later, as they saw his broken body on the cross, it would have meant everything. In the same way, he took the cup and he said, this cup is the, the new covenant in my blood. And he said, I won't drink this with you again until I drink it with you. And what we know will be the marriage supper of the Lamb, the wedding supper of the Lamb. But he said, I want you to take this and drink this in remembrance of me. And so in this simple meal, we remember Jesus and we remember ourselves. We remember the place that we are in the body of Christ. We remember who we are and how we've come to be where we are. We remember the story of grace and forgiveness that's been in our lives because of the cross. And we remember the future that is going to see more evidence of Christ's life being outworked in us. So I want you just to take the opportunity now, as I pray, to, um, for you to um, just 
use this opportunity to discern discern what it is that the Holy Spirit is saying to you. Let me pray. Lord, I thank you that by tradition, through the collective learning of your church, we don't have these crazy drunken times that we would call a church service or, a, or the Lord's Supper. We're, um, we're a lot more organized and we're a lot more religious than that group in Corinth. But that doesn't mean our hearts are in the best place. We can have good behaviors on the outside, but we know that it's the heart that concerns you the most. And so, Lord, today we, we do that inventory. In this moment, Lord, we want to ask that you forgive us for the things that you bring to our attention. We ask for your grace, your grace that's poured out freely. We ask that not only would we be forgiven, but that we can change the behaviors that we needed to be forgiven for. So Holy Spirit, we invite you by the power of your spirit to be powerful and present. For those of us, Lord, who are struggling to forgive people, for hurts that might have been as recently as this morning or yesterday or a long time ago, we offer those to you, Lord, because we don't want that pain shaping the future of our destiny. We want people to be forgiven as you forgave us. And we want to be able to move on from there in a way that helps us fulfill what it is that you want us to do with our lives, not live looking over our shoulder at the past. And we all we ask also for forgiveness for opportunities that we've missed, for things that we were ne- too nervous to pick up on, or maybe we had the wrong priorities. Or maybe we're shaping our lives now into a, a whole list of wrong priorities. Lord, we ask for these moments of reflection to, to be used by your Spirit to, to speak to us individually. And we thank you for your mercy. Thank you for your love. Thank you for your grace. Your kindness that leads us towards repentance. So in this moment, Lord, we we choose to eat and drink together as the body of Christ. As we discern your body. As we discern one another as we discern the work of your spirit in our lives. We ask this in Jesus' name. Let's eat and drink together.
Thanks, Darren, Dion, Hannah, Bailey. We live in remembrance. It's our whole life is remembering who won us, who deserves our time and our attention, who deserves to shape the future that we have. That's what this communion is all about. Not only the suffering and the pain of the cross, but to whom we belong. It's a beautiful thing, isn't it? Let's stand together for prayer. Lord, some of the words in, those, in that song were, um, who would I have become if it was not for you? It's very, again, sobering to reflect upon the impact that you've had upon our lives. The shaping the calling, the leading, the values, the attitudes, the examples that we've had from, from you, Lord, and your word and from the body of Christ. Lord, who would we be if it wasn't for you? And for that reason, Lord, we thank you for what we know as the Lord's Supper because it belongs to you and we are invited to eat at that table. And as your guests, Lord, we look to you as the author and perfecter of our lives. And we thank you for your Spirit's work that calls us to short accounts, calls us to actions of love, when by nature we'd rather do the opposite. So, Father, we ask you walk closely with us. Let us take this uh, moment that we've experienced today into the week ahead that we would love, that we would forgive, that we'd be generous, and we'd do this all for the good of others, as you call us to. We ask all this in Jesus' name. Everyone said, Amen. God bless you.